Communicable diseases are worse than wars. It's really that simple. More people have died from epidemics of communicable diseases in the history of mankind than we have ever managed to kill ourselves. And pandemics, very widespread or even global epidemics, have been worse destroyers of human life, social stability and economy than the big human wars, even the world wars. Hi, I'm Spartacus Olson. And I'm Indy Nidell. And this is Pandemic History, a Time Goes COVID-19 isolation special. In this series, we will look at how pandemics have affected humanity through the ages. We start today with the first plague pandemic. Now, now with this series, it is our hope that we can contribute a little bit to fighting the current pandemic by sharing some knowledge of the past that might give us some insight into how pandemics affect the world. It is not our place to get into the specifics of COVID-19. We will leave that to doctors, epidemiologists, medical organizations, governments, news channels. But if against all probability you haven't noticed it, you will hopefully see that this is a very serious situation. In fact, we have pretty much lost the war on pandemics for thousands of years, and if we manage to limit the damage of the current outbreak, it will be the first time in history that humanity puts up an effective fight against a pandemic. And like we said, and I'll say it again, pandemics are worse than war. Um, if you look at like World War I and the Spanish flu, the war killed 17 to 22 million people. The flu killed between around 30 million people is a low estimate, but maybe as many as 100 million people. And on top, out of the 8 to 11 million civilian Great War deaths, a large part of that was due to other diseases caused by the wartime conditions. It's also worse for the economy. Now, contrary to popular belief, war is not good for the economy either. But the effects of pandemics linger for longer and are not compensated by the increase in production that wartime economies experience. A 2006 study by Douglas Allman, professor of international and public affairs and economics at Columbia University, showed that the socioeconomic effects of the Spanish flu pandemic were still being felt in the 1980s. So the idea that letting a pandemic run its course is better for the economy instead of taking an economic short-term hit is simply not supported by the historical record. Okay, we're going to get back to influenza in a later episode, but today we wanted to go back to the beginning, right? Although epidemics have accompanied humanity as long as we have existed, we have not experienced very many pandemics. The widespread, rapid spread of disease is very much connected to how far humans can travel while symptom-free, while having a disease to spread the disease. Yes, infections take some time to make us sick. This incubation time, the time from infection to symptoms, how infectious, and how deadly the disease is decides how much it can spread. If incubation time is shorter than the time we need to go from one place to the other, the disease will spread slowly and mostly locally, creating an epidemic. If it's too deadly, people will die before they can spread the disease. And again, we have only an epidemic and not a pandemic. So the speed, distance, and numbers we travel in are important factors to creating a pandemic. For instance, as far as we know, we have only been experiencing influenza pandemics for as long as mankind has been traveling regularly within weeks to most parts of the globe, which is only the last 300 years or so. This is because influenza has an incubation time of about two weeks. But there are diseases that have longer incubation time. Or that are both zoonotic and anthroponotic that have created earlier pandemics. A disease is zoonotic when it can be transferred from other animals to humans, and it is anthroponotic when it can be transferred from humans to other animals. And it is one of those diseases that creates the first great pandemic. The disease is called by a bacterium called Yersima pestis. In common language, we call it plague. Not as in a plague of locusts or Sparty is a plague but actual plague, this is plague. Anyhow, this bacterium causes disease with really high lethality in many different animals like dogs, cats, camels, chickens, pigs, and humans. 
which is pretty rare for both bacteria and viruses, but can also infect a few species of animals without causing serious disease, chief among them marmots, but also some species of rodents, who do get sick, but not uniformly, and sometimes without dying as quickly, you know, as the same rates as, for instance, humans. In this way, these animals become carrier hosts of the disease and can transport it for a long time and for a long distance. While it's still not completely clear how the plague crosses over into an epidemic in humans, the Asian rat flea seems to be one significant path or vector by which it jumps from a carrier species to, for instance, us humans. Many plague epidemics have been preceded by a sudden increase in dead rats. So one theory is that the fleas carry the bacteria in their gut, but now they leave their dead host seeking a new home, us, so that we get the disease from them and then we spread it among ourselves. In human to human transmission, it's spread through droplet transmission, that is to say, body fluids. And plague is a gruesome disease. Normally, it infects by entering the body through damaged areas of the skin. Even microscopic skin ruptures are enough. This triggers bubonic plague. It starts with flu-like symptoms like headache, fever, or, or vomiting. Then it gets really nasty. The disease triggers the lymph nodes near the infected area to swell and fill with blood, creating swollen bulbs or buboes that soon turn black. Now these eventually rupture, releasing pus and lymphatic fluid. If the patient is unlucky, the plague has, however, now spread and causes septicemia, which ends with vomiting blood and a gradual shutdown of all organs. But, and this is what happens over and over during the Black Death, the bacteria can also enter the lungs, causing pneumonic plague, or go straight into the bloodstream and cause septicemic plague. Here, the bacteria is so virulent that the victim dies really quickly, sometimes within minutes of first showing serious symptoms. Yersinia bacteria are also special because they can survive and reproduce in below zero temperature. Combined with the vector of spreading from dead hosts through fleas and the temperature resistance, the plague can become even more dramatic when it comes along other disasters like famine and climate change. The bacterium was identified in 1894 by bacteriologist Alexandre Diarsin at the Pasteur Institute in France during an outbreak in Hong Kong, but we know that it has been around for thousands of years and may, according to recent studies, have originated in Europe and then eventually lodged permanently in animal populations in Asia. Yep, DNA evidence of human Yersinia pestis infection has been found in archaeological evidence going back to Neolithic times, and one study found an epidemic in Scandinavia that probably spread via tribal trade routes as early as 5,000 years ago. It is now a suspect in the so-called Neolithic decline in European population, an event that saw a dramatic reduction of European human populations with entire settlements simply disappearing around that time. The decline is preceded, though, by an agricultural revolution and strong population growth. Part of this is the rise in animal husbandry. So now people lived in larger groups and in close quarters with domestic animals, which might explain how the disease starts spreading in human-to-human -human transmission. The decline launches a crisis that triggers an eastward migration towards Asia, which might be the vector that brings the disease to Asia where it lodges in carrier hosts like marmots and rodents. But the first time it creates a pandemic is in 541 and 542 AD during Emperor Justinian's reign as Eastern Roman Emperor, when it seems to have started with an outbreak in Egypt and then spreads through Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, causing widespread death and social destruction. And it is here that the carrier hosts create a dramatic effect. Yeah, it's here where it gets tricky. The first outbreak is already terrible. And when it seems to be over, people breathe a sigh of relief. But it's a false sense of security. The invisible killers are still in the carrier host populations, and soon they strike again, every 10 to 15 years for the next 200 years. By the year 750, the last outbreak, it will have killed at least 25 million, perhaps as many as 100 million people. Now, if it killed only 25 million, that would already be half of the population of Europe at the time the outbreaks begin. 
The effects are far-ranging. Sure, death by disease, accidents, war, even just simply murder are daily occurrences at the time. These were brutal times. Brutal times. But even in this deadly era, those are staggering numbers. Recurring bouts of sudden death on a massive scale, and it causes disruption to social life. It wipes out large sections of the productive population, virtually stopping the economy. The psychological effects on the survivors are enormous, and they linger for generations. During the initial outbreak, Justinian himself gets the disease, but he survives, which is perhaps an unlucky turn of events for his people. You see, the emperor's refusal to take measures to lessen the effects on society makes it even worse. He has war debts, and he needs cash badly. This is what historian Procopius writes at the time. When pestilence swept through the whole known world, and notably the Roman Empire, wiping out most of the farming community, and of necessity, leaving a trail of desolation in its wake, Justinian showed no mercy towards the ruined freeholders. Even then, he did not refrain from demanding the annual tax, not only the amount at which he assessed each individual, but also the amount for which his deceased neighbors were liable. And it doesn't stop there. The plague sets off a domino effect that leaves Europe and the Middle East in absolute chaos. With agriculture at a standstill, the price for grain skyrockets, which then creates massive inflation in general. The lack of food leads to recurring famines. Crime goes way up. The economy goes into overall decline, and in the general instability that follows, a long series of wars break out. Now, Europe is already in an unstable position, with the Western Roman Empire having fallen. But it is the plague that is the last nail in the coffin that seals Europe in the Dark Ages. And during that time, the plague continues to lurk in the background. While isolated epidemics break out over the next centuries, in 1347, it is again a pandemic, the Black Death. You wrote your bachelor thesis on that, something like the cultural and social effects of the Black Death in England? No, no. It was actually, this is true, it was a fear, religion, and popular disillusion in Europe in the 1350s following the Black Death. And it looked specifically at the social consequences of the plague, the flagellants and the religious decline that, that created an environment in which a reformation could occur 150 years later. But it did cover the plague in general. Anyway, this plague is going to kick humanity in the groin. Well, humanity on the Eurasian landmass and in Africa, while people in the Western Hemisphere and Oceania are at this point still isolated from global exchange and will not be affected. So, if, as recent theories suggest, the plague originated in Europe, it now returns in 1347 to Europe from Asia with a vengeance. And that is what we will cover in our next episode. Now, we won't go into the details of the events of the Black Death. In fact, I want to make a whole Time Ghost chronological series on that pandemic. But we will look at the human, social, and economic effects of that plague pandemic, and the last one in the 19th century. And as you shall see when we return, it is here that the plague, as a fellow apocalyptic writer with war, famine, and death, comes into play. And like with Justinian's plague, the Black Death will cause gargantuan and tragic destruction, made worse by mismanagement and unwillingness to accept reality by the rulers and the general population alike. Now, if you're watching during the COVID-19 outbreak, stay safe, stay healthy, stay at home, and we might just win this one. It is thanks to the Time Ghost Army that we can make content like this our World War II in Real Time channel, and all the other amazing content. It is amazing. It is amazing. All yeah. the other amazing con content that we do, even during these trying times. So please join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. See you next time. <laughs>